Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. This is your host, the mistress of mystery, Misty Malloy, coming to you from down on the waterfront in San Francisco from my boat rental place. I'm not in the best part of town, I'm not gonna lie. You can dress it up to look honest, but that doesn't do any good, because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, if you had to eat morals, you'd have bone rattle in three days. <sighs> Adams decided to follow the advice of that one random guy who said he should become executive producer and let someone else host. So he's over there in Idaho, spinning around in an office chair and eating a potato of some sort, I'm sure. I mean, they put it on the license plates, don't they? Buckle up, I'm driving this bus now, and it's gonna be a bumpy ride. If you have a comment, email it to Box13 at Great Detectives. Check us out on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And follow us on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash great detectives. Today, we're going to bring you an episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date is October 13, 1953. It's the Philip Mori Matter. Enjoy! WBBM-FM, Chicago. Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Donald Maynard, Johnny. Oh, no, Mr. Maynard. You employed? No, not a bit. Just closed out a case. Fine. Can you go to New York? Yeah, I guess so. What's it all about? Well, this company insures Maury Productions Incorporated. It's a film television company shooting in New York. The star is Philip Maury. Uh-huh. Well, production stopped last Wednesday. We were notified that Maury had suffered a breakdown and couldn't continue for a while. It's costing us plenty. They've got a pretty big company. Cast and crew are all under contract and have to get paid. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, anything you can. The doctor definitely confirms the breakdown, but he says he's sure it's due to some personal crisis. See what you can find out. See if you can't do something to snap Maury out of it. Okay. Right away, huh? As soon as I pack a bag. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends... The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Philip Maury matter. Expense account item one, $19.85, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. Item two, 75 cents, cab fare to a hotel, where I registered and called the offices of the Maury Production Company. I made an appointment to see Mr. Milton Gradkey, the producer. Expense account item three, 55 cents for another cab to Gradkey's well-appointed office on 45th Street. Really, Mr. Dollar, I'm just as concerned about this situation as the insurance company is. In fact, I'm probably a whole lot more concerned. A whole lot. Well, we've got a schedule to meet. We've got a sponsor and a network to account to. And if our star is sick, I... I just came down to see if I could help. 
It's a breakdown, Mr. Dollar. Who can help with a breakdown? Are you a doctor? You're a close friend, huh? Yes, yes, very close. I can't do anything. How could you? What caused the breakdown? <sighs> Such a question. What causes the breakdown? What causes breakdowns? Again, it's for a doctor to say I'm only a producer. Well, the company doctor felt it was something of a personal nature. Something more than just overwork. Well, I, I know Phil is sick. He's really in a bad shape. And I know if he doesn't snap out of it, this show is going on the rocks. It may be personal, but that's not for me to say. Phil's had enough trouble in the past. Well, this time he could be ruined. Who is his personal physician? Ewing, Charles Ewing, the best man for this sort of thing. I got the best. I'd like to talk to him. He's probably over with Phil now. Oh, fine. I'll stop by. Oh, he, uh, he won't allow you to see Phil. You can't see him, Mr. Dollar. Okay, then I'll just talk to the doctor. Maybe Ewing's back at his office now. Why don't you, uh, go over to his office instead, huh? It'll be a whole lot easier if you go over to Mr. his... Mr. Gradke. Yes? What's the matter? Don't you want me to talk with Philip Morey? He's sick, very sick. You sure that's all? Of course that's all. You got the doctor's report? Yeah, but if you don't mind, I'll check it myself. Your company may be in trouble, Mr. Gradke, but my company is paying for it. <laughs> Expense account item four. A dollar and twenty-five cents for still another cab. Philip Morey was residing in an apartment on Park Avenue. I had trouble getting by the doorman, the receptionist at the switchboard, and the elevator operator, but I got by them. I walked down the third floor of the building and knocked on the door to Philip Morey's apartment. Yes? Uh, Dr. Ewing? Uh, no, he just left. My name is Dollar. I'd like to see Mr. Morey. I'm sorry, no one can see Mr. Morey. He's quite ill. Who are you? What business is that of yours? I'm a special agent for national life and casualty. I was sent here to make a report on Mr. Morey's condition. Well, then I suggest you talk to Dr. Ewing. Now, wait a minute. Look, I told you to... Hey, Richard. Where, where's the beep? What's going on? Mr. Morey? Yeah? Phil, you better go on back in your room. Why? What do you want, Edward? My name is Dollar, Mr. Morey. Okay. What's it all about, huh? I told him you weren't seeing anyone. Yeah. He's from the insurance company. I don't want any. You already have it. I just came down here to wait see if I could help... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want any insurance. I'm a lousy risk. Phil. Well, no, no. Go on, Phil. Beat it, do you hear me? Go on. Okay, okay, don't get rough. You're in no condition. Uh, you think so, huh? Look, Mr. Morey, my company got a report that you'd suffered a breakdown. Yeah. Well, good for them. It looks to me more like a 90-proof breakdown, and it smells like it, too. Well, what's it to you? Plenty. My company's paying a lot of money while you're laid up. As long as it's a legitimate illness, they're obligated to keep on paying. And if I'm just drunk? I doubt if my company would think kindly of you, Mr. Morey. <laughs> well, isn't that just too bad? Mr. Dollar, he didn't start hitting the bottle until last just night. Just forget the excuses. Just drop it. And you get out of here now, huh? Go on, get out. Okay, okay. And tell your stinking company I'm going to stay drunk until we have another blue snow. Okay? It's fine with me. I'll send you a sled with a coffin on it. I was supposed to help Maury straighten himself out. But this wasn't just a breakdown. He was boiled to the eyebrows. And if you could go on past performances, it was an odds-on bet he'd stay that way. Expense account item five. A dollar and 35 cents cab fare from the Park Avenue apartment to the hotel, where I went to the bar to cool off. I had a fast one and was reaching for another when I was interrupted. Mr. Dollar? Hmm? Oh. I talked with Milt Gradke and he told me you were staying here. Okay. Uh, first, let me apologize for what Forget happened. Forget it. Uh, can I sit down? Sure. Well, we really didn't meet officially. I'm Richard Long. I'm the writer-director on the series. Well, if Maury stays loaded, you're going to be out of a job. He just started drinking last night. Insurance doesn't cover a lost weekend. I'll have to report it. They'll cancel. It's going to be rough. His wife left him. 
Oh, that's the reason, huh? Yeah. She's going to sue. They've been trying to do everything we could to get Phil in shape. Well, from the way he looked, you'd better forget it. Well, if this one blows up, he's through. He's finished for good. It's happened before. Yeah. But isn't it too bad? Yeah, I guess it is. He's one of the biggest talents we've ever had in this business. And he's gotten into more trouble. Look, I, I'm not defending his mistakes, just his talent. If you're going to ask me not to make that report Look, to my Mr. company... Look, Mr. Dollar, I know you've got a job. I know your company can't be expected to keep on paying while Phil's in this condition. Well, I'm glad you understand. But they've paid up till now, and believe me, you've got my word. Until last night, Phil Maury hadn't touched a drop. Well, even if that's true, Maury's drinking now, and he looks like he's good for a long, long time. He's fallen off before, hasn't he? Yes. He lost his motion picture contract the last time, didn't he? Yes, but all that straightened itself out. It looked pretty crooked this afternoon. <laughs> this would never have happened in a million years if it wasn't for that wife. Well, that's another one of his patterns, isn't it? He's been sued by more ex-wives. Mr. Zoller, I've never said he was right. I, I never said any of the trouble was anything else but his own fault. But you don't know him. Not, not many people do. This guy is the most considerate, charitable... When he's sober... Listen, if you've got about 12 hours sometime, I'd like to impress you with some of the good things on the other side of the ledger. He's given Janet everything she could want. Sure, he was wrong. He should have belted her one and told her to keep in line. He's made the same mistake with every woman he's ever been involved with, and they've all taken him. Nearly everyone's taken him. Business managers, agents. You think them up and they've had their fingers in the pie. But for a while, that was a pretty big pie. Sounds like fodder for a good psychoanalyst. Yeah, but... Well, Janet's leaving him was too much. Even as bad as he was, he didn't hit the bottle. He just kind of folded up, but he stayed on the wagon. Until last night. Yeah. Her lawyer called, and Phil got to the phone before I did. He was almost well, didn't care if he ever saw her again. The lawyer said lawsuit, and Phil headed for the bar. Well, a breakdown is one thing, but a drunk is something else. And he doesn't exactly have the cleanest record in the world. A couple of his binges turned into marathons. Well, I don't know what to do. That's why I wanted to see him. I was sent down here to straighten him out if I could. Get that dame to lay off the lawsuit and you can. Well, maybe she thinks she's got a case. The other wives did all right. Well, that's why he flipped. He just can't afford it. You got any idea how much alimony he's paying right now? Yeah, I've heard. And it's more than just the dough. This one's taking him. He's played it straight all the way. Gave her everything she wanted. Laid off the booze. Really, I know. He tried to make this one work. And why did she leave him? She figured it was the right time. He's going good. Still got a lot of money. She's a tramp. Does he think so? Well, he does now. I never said anything to him while they were together, and there was a lot I could have said, but, you know, you, you just don't do those things. No, it never helps. After she left him, I finally sat him down and gave it to him straight. He got sore, but he listened, and he started putting things together. She played around all over the place while she was with him, but she did it smart. It's the old story about the husband being the last one to know. And he took it? Yeah. It helped. I really gave it to him, everything I knew. He must have made quite a study. Well, she threw a few pitches my way. Well, if you know all these things, why not let her take it to court? Sounds like you've got enough on her to stop any kind of a suit. Oh, no, no. I, I said she played it smart. It's all hearsay. She'd just deny it, and who's going to call her a liar? The guys she was mixed up with? Maybe. Uh-uh. Not these guys. They were hand-picked. You said she threw a few pitches your way. Look, Dollar, Maury's my closest friend. What do you think I'm going to do? Well, I came down here to see if I could help. But it looks pretty hopeless. I don't know. He looked like he was headed for a wet evening. Anyone holding his hand? Yeah, I left Milt with him. We've been working in shifts. His wife's name is Janet, isn't it? Yeah. Where does she live? Uh, 55 West 125th Street. Okay. Why don't you wait for me here? You going over to see her? I'm supposed to save my company money, Mr. Long. Maybe Mrs. Maury can suggest something. Are you kidding? Yeah. But have you got a better idea? Good luck. Friends... Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, 
gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I left Long in the hotel bar and ran up expense account item six, one dollar and forty-five cents, for one more cab to take me to Mrs. Philip Morey's apartment building. I buzzed for the elevator, and when it arrived, a man stepped out and brushed my shoulder. Sorry. I'd seen him before someplace, and while the elevator took me up to the fourth floor, I tried to place him. Oh, I couldn't remember. But for some reason, the man seemed to be important. I got off at the fourth floor, still trying to place the face, and walked down the hall to Mrs. Morey's apartment. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Morey? Yes? My name is Dollar. I'm a special investigator for National Life and Casualty. Insurance? Yes. Well, I'm sorry, but I... My company insures your husband's television production. Oh. You mind if I come in and talk to you? No. Come on in. I don't quite understand, Mr. Uh, Uh, Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Sit down, please. Oh, thanks. My husband's production company is insured? That's right. Insured for what? Oh, accidents, illness. Oh. Well, how'd you find me? Mr. Long. I see. I have to make a complete investigation, Mrs. Morey. You see, when your husband was taken ill... Taken ill? Well, that's the report that was turned into the company. Well, I guess you could call it that. What would you call it? He's plastered. You know what that means. I sure do. I left him. I'm going to get a divorce. Well, aside from your personal differences, if your husband is just drinking, if that's the reason that production has been held up, My company will cancel his insurance. So? He won't be able to get insurance from any other company. Look, Mr. Dollar, do you know anything about Phil? Well, just what I've read. Well, that's been bad, all right, but you've got to live with a guy to really get the full effect. You wouldn't believe it. Well, I understood he's been a pretty good boy until recently. Why don't you go talk to my husband? I saw him earlier today. How'd you like it? It was a little tense. Was he sober? Not even close. Well. But I understand he just started drinking. Oh, that's dandy. Do you think they're going to tell you that he's been blind for the last month? You can take my word for it. He's no good. I tried. I was number four, and I certainly tried to do everything I could to make it work. Well, if it was that bad, I can't blame you. But this will ruin him. He was ruined the day he was born. Oh, he'll get along. He's still got a lot of money. After all the alimony he's been paying out? Mr. Dollar, Phil has made over six million since he started in the business. He could still afford a dozen more wives if anyone will have him. Well, I'm glad to hear that you'll be taken care of. You bet your life I'll be taken care of. After all I put up with, I deserve to be taken care of. Taken care of good. Uh Uh-huh. Well... Oh, you don't have to go. Let me buy you a drink. Well, sure. What's your poison? Anything that's handy. Just uh, water it. Bourbon? Fine, fine. I suppose Richard Long told you what a terrible woman I am. He mentioned something about it. Yeah, he would. He's a jealous little fellow. There you are. Oh, thanks. Cheers. Sure. Richard tried everything he could to break us up. And what a heel. After we'd been married for only a couple of months, Richard started making the old pitch. How do you like that? Well, uh, I can understand it. Hmm. Thanks. 
but Richard's supposed to be Phil's closest friend. An attractive woman can fracture a friendship in a hurry, under the right circumstances. The circumstances were anything but right, Mr. Dollar. Well, can't blame a man for trying. Don't you have any scruples? A couple. But I left them back in the third grade. Insurance business, huh? Yeah. You make a lot of money? Enough. It has other compensations. Tell me about them. Well, uh, good drink now and then. I bet you meet a lot of interesting people. Oh, lots, lots. What'd you say your first name was? I didn't. But it's Johnny. Johnny Dollar. Mm hmm. Nice, expensive sound. You should get a load of my expense account sometime. I'd love to. You know, uh, I saw a picture of you once. Really? Yeah. In a bathing suit. I was a model before I met Phil. I had lots of pictures taken in bathing suits. I think this was taken just before you married him. It was on the front page, showing you were the girl that was going to be the fourth Mrs. Morey. Oh, that one. Yeah. That was a rather good one. Rather. That book there on the table is just full of pictures taken while I was modeling. Oh? Oh, this one? Mm Mm-hmm. Browse around. Oh, I'd love to. That's a good one. Yes. Oh, and here's one. We need a whole bunch of these on the beach. This is the best one of the lot. Yeah, yeah. Nice, um, nice tan. (laughs) Isn't that one cute? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? How are you a drink? It just curdled. Let me build you a fresh one. Oh, no, thanks. I have to go. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. You won't be, honey. I don't think I understand that, Johnny. I'll tell you all about it sometime. It'll give you a real kick. I left Mrs. Moray looking a little worried. And whether she knew it or not, she had a right to be. In one of the pictures she'd shown me, I'd spotted the man. The man I'd bumped into coming out of the elevator. And I remembered who he was. Expense account item seven, one dollar and forty-five cents. Cab fare back to the hotel, where I told Richard Long about the man in the picture. Eugene Sweet. Ever heard of him? No. I couldn't remember until I saw that picture. It was a big case in L.A. He was convicted and sentenced. Did three years for forgery. I was in on the case. Sweet. No, I don't know. And there was a girl mixed up in it. Janet? No, no. But it was an interesting setup. Sweet introduced the girl to a wealthy old man. The girl married the wealthy old man. Now, it seems the girl would have Sweet sign her husband's name to a check, then she'd fill in the amount and cash it. Not big checks. But after about four years, they added up. Well, a man named Swift introduced Phil to Janet. I never did like him. He used to hang around all the time. Phil got tired of him in a hurry and gave him a bounce. What did he look like? Oh, he was tall, kind of greasy around the edges, weighed about, I don't know, about as much as I do. Where does he live? I don't know. I've only seen him a couple of times since Phil got rid of him. Why, you think Swift might be this, uh, this sweet or whatever his name is? Well, it's a long shot, but you never know. I guess I could find out. Milt might know. Would Janet? Sure. She might. Why don't we ask her? Yeah. Why don't we just go back to her place and you have a look at that picture book? I'm with you. Long's car was parked outside the hotel. We piled in and drove back to Mrs. Morey's apartment building. We parked just in time to see a man enter by the front door. That's him, Swift. He just went into Janet's building. And he came out about an hour ago. You mean Swift's the guy you were talking... Eugene Sweet. Arrested in Los Angeles in 1949. Well, come on. Well, it might be perfectly innocent. And a pig's eye. I bet that dame's been working the same kind of setup you told me Sweet worked with the other one. He doesn't do anything. How does he support himself? Well, if he's with Mrs. Morey, we can always ask him... We went into the lobby and waited for the elevator to come down. Long looked happier than a kid in an acre of new cement, and there was just a chance he had a right to be. The elevator arrived, and so did Milt Gradke, the producer, who came busting into the lobby from the street. 
Melt? Richard. Richard, I've been calling you all over the place. What's the matter? Phil, he's loose. I couldn't keep him in the apartment. Oh, no. I tried, but he got rough. He tried calling Janet, but she hung up on him. Then he went wild. You think he's here with Janet? Yes, and that's not the half of it. Come on, we better get up there. There's no telling what he might do. You know about it? What do you mean about Sweet? Who? Sweet. I'll tell you later. I thought you meant the gun. Gun? Yes, Phil's got a gun with him. On the way up, Long explained as much as he could to Gradke, and Gradke continued to apologize for not being able to restrain Maury. We left the elevator on the fourth floor and hurried down to Mrs. Maury's apartment. The door was ajar. Sounds like they're all in there. Well, what are we going to do? Well, if he's got a gun... He sure has. I'm going in. Get back! Get back. Get back. He's trying to do something! Put down the gun, Maury. Get back. I warn you. Don't anybody get near me. I I swear I'll shoot. Well. Not even you, Dick, no. You too, Milk. Get back. Miss Dane. Miss Dane thought she was going to take me. She's not going to get away with it. No, no, no. I am through. Nothing's left. So I'm going to do it up brown. What, what do you think of this dame, Dick? Look. Look who comes to see you. His real name's Sweet. Eugene Sweet. Huh? What? That's right, Maury. He's done time. Yeah? <laughs> Maury, put down the gun. Uh-uh. It's a better than even bet that your wife's been pulling a fancy bit of hijacking with Sweet. Huh? That's right. Tell him about it, you little tramp. Yeah. Tell me about it. Ah, look, Phil. I want the whole thing. How did you take me? Come on. He introduced you to Janet, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he did. They had it all settled. She marries you, sticks around for a while, and Sweet, being a good forger, signs your name to some checks. Tell him, Janet. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. Phil, look, you didn't do wrong. You did everything right, for goodness sakes. Phil, nobody's going to blame you now. Yeah. Only put away that gun. Put it down, Mr. Morey. Stay back. Mr. Morey, these two men have a lot of belief in you. They think you can straighten out in spite of everything that's happened. Now, nobody's going to blame you for anything unless you use that gun. Frankly, what happens to you doesn't make any difference to me. It doesn't make any difference to anyone. It does to these two guys. Why don't you start thinking about somebody else for a change? Let's see you prove you're worthy of their friendship. Stay away. Give me that gun. Uh, Now, come on. uh, You're not whipped. Everybody gets in a slump now and then. Come on. Give me the gun, Mr. Morey. <laughs> By the time the cops got there, Janet and Sweet had told me the whole story. They admitted cashing Ford's checks to the tune of $300,000. And that wasn't counting what Maury had given her legally. If I hadn't recognized Eugene Sweet, Janet would probably have won a nice settlement to go along with everything else. Maury had written so many checks, he never would have noticed the extra ones. Oh, he was a setup. He spent money hand over fist, and his business manager would never think a dozen small checks a week were forged. Expense account item eight, $54, hotel bill. Item nine, $18.83. Train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $99.38. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends... Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's 
Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Joe Duvall, Sidney Miller, High Everback, Bill Johnstone, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Here Chicago's favorite shows on... Welcome back. This is your executive producer. No, no, I, I'm still really your host. I hope if anyone got a bit nervous about me actually doing this, they looked at their calendar and realized what day of the year it was. Or if you're watching this on YouTube several weeks later, you looked at the title that said this was originally an April 1st program. Thank you to Misty Malloy herself. A.K.A. Aaron Lillis of the No Sleep Podcast. And so many other projects she has lent her talents to as a voice actress. She did such a good job when I played it for my wife. She suggested that maybe some people would be disappointed when they found out that uh, we were not actually going to have Misty Malloy hosting the podcast. I think she was teasing. I think. But thanks so much, Aaron. Now, on to the episode itself. I think you have to keep in mind the way that early television worked. Uh, we're not told what type of show the Philip Morris show uh, was, but I would kind of assume that it was a situation comedy. If it were a variety show and he was having a bit of a breakdown, you could kind of work around it. You could do a episode and say, you know, Philip is not feeling well this week. And so we have a very special guest host and just work through it that way. I think that uh, as opposed to radio, it was a lot harder on television just to substitute in a different actor for your lead, particularly if you would have to do that more than once. Now, today, if you had a lead who was having, like, some mental health challenges, usually, uh, unless uh, you were at a very sensitive time in the filming, you could kind of work around that. You could film multiple episodes and scenes that they aren't in. However, this was the early days of television. And there are a couple of options for how this could have been done. It could have been a live TV sitcom, in which case your star uh, needed to be good to go every week. Uh, he needed to be there for rehearsals. He needed to be there for the show. And it was just unrelenting. Or you could be dealing with a, a film sitcom. And honestly, after I Love Lucy, most sitcoms started to go this route. Uh, the big problem with a film sitcom is how many episodes they did. Uh, it was pretty usual to do 39 episodes a season and that requires a grueling unremitting unforgiving production schedule particularly if you're the main star and you're in most of the scenes i mean today we do you know 10 12 15 episode seasons if that and that can be a bit more manageable depending on what your shooting schedule is but there just wasn't the give which is why i think this was a big crisis back in uh, 1953 when it 
probably would not have been today. Without they would be calling the insurance company at this point. You know, they would have an issue that they would need resolved, but Johnny Dollar is not going to be called to fix it. Now, of course, this episode does reflect the attitudes of the time. And, of course, we have a lot of people today who say, and, you know, make the case that alcoholism is a disease. And there's a strong argument uh, for that. I won't, you know, get too much into that, but, you know, it does come down to what does the policy say. And so in this case, apparently the policy say that it would not include a case where an actor was drunk. And I'm not certain whether that was a general policy the insurance company would have had, or if it was specific to that policy because Mr. Morey had a background of having these sort of issues. I did find it interesting, and I think there's this idea, someone even said at some point, that Maury is not really like this. Usually, he's mu a much kinder, generous uh, person, and it's not something that's often acknowledged or even discussed as a possibility. The idea that uh, the people Johnny meets, he's not seen them, you know, at their usual, but kind of under some serious stress. And so extreme that they are just not themselves. And that does play into how Johnny is able to talk him down in the end, because points out the fact that he has these friends who really and truly believe in him. Which isn't always the case when you're a star in show business. You know, you get those sort of hangers-on and those people who ultimately only care or act like they care about you in order to get something. And obviously, that's not the case with... Uh, Mr. Morey's friends. They believe in him, they care about him, and it goes beyond business. So I thought that was a good touch. Although some of the advice his friends gave, and I think uh, listeners will know the one I'm talking about, is kind of like, did you really say that? And I guess it does speak to Mr. Morey's character that he did not take that awful advice. On another note, the actor who played the producer, uh, I actually heard him in one in 1953 of uh, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. He played an agent, so he seems to have a thing of playing agents, producers, and others who represent or are around show business people. So an interesting speciality. All right, well, now I want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporters of the day. Thank you to Lisa and Jim. Both have been supporting the podcast since April 2016, and both at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for six years of Patreon support. Well, that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. We'll be back next Friday with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But coming up tomorrow, join us for another adventure with Ranger Jace Pearson on Tales of the Texas Rangers, where... <laughs> Good thing you ain't seeing you take this alfalfa or you'd lose your job for sure. After tomorrow, I can afford to lose it. Farm work ain't for men, it's for horses. Hey, come on, we rested long enough. I want to get you away from here. Okay. Hey, give me that pitchfork. I'll push those last two bales back and make more room on the tail of the yeah, truck. Here it is. I got a real surprise tomorrow. When... What's the matter, Slim? Shh. There's something moving. I don't hear nothing. There it is again. Maybe it's Mullen. Maybe he woke up. Keep quiet, Trent. Who's out in this field? It is him. Shut up. You better answer me. I can see the outline of your truck. Slim, I got to start up and get out of here. No! <laughs> he woke up. He must know I'm not in the house. So pile in the truck and come with me, quick. Hey, go to jail, lady. You fool, no. I'll slide around behind the truck. You stay here until he comes up to you. Yeah, but I don't... Don't I tell you! Who are you? Talk up fast. It's me, you Mullen. Harry Trent. Harry Trent, huh? You lost, Trent? What are you doing in my field in the middle of the night with a truck full of my alfalfa? Uh, oh, well... Save it, Trent. Where's Slim? Where to run to? I didn't run any place, Mullen. You know... Don't move! There's a pitchfork you feel against your ribs. 
Just marched back to the house. What are you going to do to him, Slim? I'm going to lend him my bottle of sleeping pills and see to it that he takes an overdose of them. It's nice, clean, and quiet. That idea would be great, Slim, if I'd hold still for it. But I ain't about to hold still. Look out, Slim. Punch him, Trent. Let go of that fort, Mullen. <laughs> now, Mullen, here's something you don't have to hold still for. <laughs> but you'll hold still this time. <laughs> you killed him. You killed him. You shut up. Stop that and shut up. <laughs> oh, we gotta run, Slim. We you gotta do nothing. Get that load out of here and sell it like we planned. Then keep your mouth shut. If you don't, I'll shut it for you. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.